Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Remkus Koistra. This talk is for the IS Conference at the King's University in winter 2021. This talk is entitled Fear, Identity, and Quantitative Facts. In his videos for this IS Conference, Scott Bader Say talked about getting trapped in our fears. These fears prevent the creation of human community, prevent the reciprocal exchange of gifts, prevent the building of the Basilea of God. Moreover, these fears are deeply connected to our identity. Threats to our identity create and sustain our fear. Bader Say asked us, how do we overcome these fears and live into a vision of renewal and reconciliation? How do we overcome the threats to our identity? How can we build a community where we can accept and welcome the other? I'm a mathematician. I'm interested in numbers. I'm interested in numbers for their own sake, for the glorious patterns and beauty they contain. But I'm also interested in numbers for their cultural action, for what they do, for how they work in culture, for how they influence us and control us, for how they are contested, decided, used, and interpreted. I'm interested in quantitative facts, the numbers we can assign to the world that represent a truth about it. I want to talk about the role that numbers, that quantitative facts, have in the project that Bader Say proposes, the project to overcome our fears, to address the threats to our identity, to build a community that welcomes the other. What role do numbers have in building the Basilea of God? I want to do this in two parts, reflecting both the benefits and pitfalls of quantitative facts. In religious language, I want to present numbers as prophecy and numbers as idolatry. Before I start these two sections, let me be clear about what I'm talking about. This is a video about the cultural role of quantitative facts. Quantitative facts are numbers that describe the world. They are produced by a reliable process and they can be trusted as an accurate record of the world. I'll try to avoid getting too deep into epistemology here. Ask your philosophy professors about truth and knowledge if you wish. But when I say quantitative facts, some of you probably thought about natural science, and that's good. Much of science is about producing this accurate record of quantitative facts. Take, for example, these important questions. How effective is this vaccine? What is the reproductive rate of this virus? How much radon gas is there in the soil of Alberta? How much has the average global temperature changed over the last century? These are questions that have numerical answers. Moreover, natural science has reliable methods for producing the numbers that answer these questions up to a certain precision, of course. However, quantitative facts are more than just natural science. They are also produced in history, economics, business, social science, and many others. Consider these important questions. How many people struggle with mental illness? How effective are the government's tax incentives? How many people immigrated to Canada in the 20th century and from where? Again, these are actual numbers that answer these questions. The disciplines I mentioned have reliable tools for producing the numbers that answer these questions. The answer to all these questions is what I mean by numbers, by quantitative facts. Now let me move on to the main first piece of this video, numbers as prophetic. We live in a culture of disputed facts, and that's even true for quantitative facts. This video was recorded the week of January the 4th, so I feel I can't avoid the most obvious example. How many votes for ca were cast for which candidates in the recent American presidential election? This is perhaps a prime example of the cultural place of numbers, since this is just strictly an actual counting. For another important example, one mentioned at the start of Scott Bader Say's first video, consider the statistics of climate change. How much has the global temperature increased? What are the other quantitative ways in which climate has shifted? Even though the methods of natural science have produced consistent and reliable numerical results, these facts are contested in the public sphere. Our present public discourse includes the simple rejection of quantitative facts. I've carefully tried to avoid saying that our faith in facts has eroded. While we may be in a period of increased attack on reliability of quantitative fact, 
the challenge of accepting and agreeing upon quantitative fact is a perennial human challenge. I don't believe we've fallen from any previous golden age of faith in science. Quantitative fact has always been disputed in the public sphere to some extent. That said, the nature of our current cultural discourse is unique in notable ways, in particular due to the way that electronic communication and social media have changed how we talk to each other. In a culture of disputed facts, we cannot agree on a record of what is the case. We cannot agree on the situation we are in. This enables the fear and manipulation that Bader Say talked about. If reliable quantitative fact can simply be dismissed out of preference, then we can be sold whatever alternative version of reality that those with power and influence wish to sell us. We devolved into a cultural shouting match, where repetition and volume are the only arbiters of truth. We can make arbitrary choices of which demagogues to trust, based simply on preference. Such a culture builds the fear of the other that Bader Say is asking us to strive against. Though my examples might seem to imply that the criticism is primarily directed at American right-wing political movements, this is a persistent human problem. There have been left-wing demagogues, Christian demagogues, atheist demagogues, etc. All human movements are susceptible to the temptation to adopt facts which are convenient to them. In this culture of disputed facts, numbers can be prophetic. My understanding of the term prophecy here comes from Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar and writer on the Hebrew prophets. Prophecy starts with stating the truth, with a reliable record of pain and grief. The cultural powers, the empire in Brueggemann's language, want to deny the record of pain and grief. They want to pretend that everything is fine, to silence the voices that speak the abuses of empire. Prophecy starts with making those abuses clear, with speaking the pain and grief that is. It starts by claiming a public record, a history that cannot be denied. Numbers and quantitative facts have an important role to play in this public record. Let me be concrete here and talk about a very important example of the prophetic record of pain and grief, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on Canadian Residential Schools. I chose this example for a number of reasons. First, it is a well-known and important event in recent Canadian history. Second, for Canadians of immigrant descent, First Nations people are often one of the others that Bader talks about. Third, racism towards and problematic treatment of First Nations persons is an ongoing evil reality in Canada. However, I'm aware and would like to clearly state that these are not my stories. I'm a white Canadian of immigrant descent, and therefore, I necessarily speak from a position of privilege. I speak from the position, frankly, of the Empire, and my white, Christian, and immigrant tradition is complicit in the abuse of the residential school system. I also speak from a distance, since the stories of the TRC are stories that I cannot own in any way. Hopefully, from this position, I can speak truthfully and respectfully. I will try to do so. Among its many tasks, the TRC collected and established a historical quantitative record, reliable numbers that speak to the truth of what happened in residential schools. There were over 150,000 total students. In the year 1944 to 45, 31.1% of Aboriginal students were in residential schools. In the peak in the 50s, over 10,000 students were enrolled. There's a record of the many, many deaths of students over the years of the program. As of January the 31st, 2015, there were 37,951 assault and sexual assault claims. And these are just a few of the many numbers in that report that form this historical record. These numbers establish the truth. The horror of the residential school system was not an isolated or minor problem. The numbers bear witness to the reality of what happened. Faith in the numbers and the methods by which those numbers are established is a bulwark against cultural forces that seek to undermine the reality. 
forces that claim that the problem was minor and isolated, that only a small number of schools involved abuse, that the impact is minimal and lost to history. The empire seeks to diminish the criticism of its actions. The numbers insist that they cannot be diminished. Scott Badersay talks about the fragility of our identity and how that fragility leads to fear. The numbers in the TRC report represent an attack on the false identity for people like me, white Christian Canadians of immigrant descent. We'd like to think that we were well-intentioned, helpful, and kind people. We want credit for our good intentions. We like the cultural idea of the helpful, polite, and culturally sensitive Canadian. This idea is destroyed by the TRC report and the way that white immigrant descended community is complicit in the history of residential schools. We have a choice to accept the numbers and deal with the impact that they have to our false identity or to reject the numbers and cling to our false identity out of fear. Only by accepting the public record can we hope to rebuild our identity into one that can welcome the other. This is how numbers are prophetic. By insisting on the historical record as true and reliable, we have to face our false identity. We have to deal with the ways in which we are complicit in this pain and the fact that the attitudes, assumptions, and good religious intentions that caused so much harm are still present in white culture today. This type of quantitative fact, this historical record, is part of what the university is all about. In addition to being a teaching institution, King's is a research institution. Much, though by no means all, of the research work of a university is the establishment of quantitative fact, of a public record stated in numbers. In quantitative university research, we develop methods and processes that we believe are reliable for producing quantitative facts. The missions of the King's University involves equipping students for renewal and reconciliation. This mission must include our research. One of the fundamental ways that our mission and our research connect is in the production of reliable facts of a public record. This is a step towards renewal and rec reconciliation because making firm the record of what is the case leads us to something that is true. The numbers insist that the various cultural powers cannot deny or reject this record. Our own Dr. Mark Sandel, a historian, gave a very memorable talk where he described the production of this public record as his responsibility towards the dead. Lastly, the reliability of quantitative fact is a defense against the manipulation due to fear. When we are enthralled to fear, that fear can lead us to reject any facts which are inconvenient to our false identity. We don't want to change our lifestyles and habits, so we reject the facts of climate change. We don't want to have to change our naive identity as generically good and kind people, so we reject the historical record of racism and violence. In rejecting these facts, we are vulnerable to their replacement by whomever provides more convenient facts that do not threaten our precious false identities. The creation of reliable quantitative facts can be prophetic truth-speaking. It can serve as a record of what is the case, a record that can stand up to attack from the powers that be. But quantitative facts are never the whole truth. In this second part of my video, after the benefits of number as prophecy, I want to talk about the risks of number as idolatry. I use the TRC report as an example, but my use of it was perhaps very strange. I picked out some numbers and some graphs from a few pages, but what is in the rest of those pages? Those pages are filled with narratives. In fact, the numbers are a tiny part of the report. The vast majority of it consists of stories. To take a terrible oversimplification for the sake of the rhetoric, apologies to the aforementioned philosophers who teach epistemology, I could propose here that truth comes in at least two forms, number and narrative. For all I said about number, about quantitative fact, there is a risk. Numbers are not nothing, but they are far from everything. Number without narrative is insufficient as an understanding of truth. In the prophetic role I talked about in the previous section, it should never be understood that quantitative facts have a monopoly on this role. In many ways, narrative is the more powerful of the two forms of truth. Quantitative fact is an important part of the public record, 
but it can never be the entire public record. Some cultural forces, in response to a culture that contests and rejects reliably quantitative facts, want to fight back by making quantitative fact the ultimate and only truth. If quantitative fact is the only truth, then identity is also entirely numerical. I am reduced to a mess of quantitative data, an age, some demographic information, a blood type, a DNA sequence, a dance of chemical concentrations in my cells and blood. Such an overreaction is perhaps understandable in a world where, where reliable quantitative fact is under attack, but it is an overreaction. Instead of science, it is scientism. I call this idolatry because it relates to identity. The understanding of our fundamental identity is a religious commitment, conscious or otherwise. For Christians, we understand fundamentally that we are loved and cherished children of God. One way to understand idolatry, my understanding of this term comes mostly from the books of William Stringfellow, is that an idol is something that usurps our fundamental identity. An idol is something that gives a person meaning and purpose. Money is an idol when our fundamental identity becomes financial and economic. Skills and talents are idols when our fundamental identity is our ability to run, to sing, or to think. Power is an idol when our fundamental identity is our ability to influence and control the people and situations around us. Even family, school, and church can be idols if our fundamental identity becomes our roles as family members, as students or teachers, as church members. If we make number absolute, then number creates our identity and all other forms of expression of truth are discarded for not being presented in numbers. This makes number an idol. In the world where number is absolute, the, the TRC process and commission can be reduced from many thousands upon thousands of personal stories and history to just a few pages of statistics. As important as the numerical record of the TRC is, reducing the entire point report to those numbers would be an abomination. As a mathematician, I study what numbers can accomplish. Numbers are amazing for what they can do. The scope and application of mathematics to produce reliable and consistent models of the quantitative world is simply astounding. However, studying numbers also teaches what they cannot accomplish. This is perhaps even more important. I believe that anyone who studies mathematics carefully and diligently, anyone who is paying attention, must also become convinced of the remarkable limitation of numbers. In particular, the mathematician learns that numbers cannot create or impose or overwrite narratives, that truth consists of both numbers and narratives and cannot be reduced. Scott Bader Say invited us into a process to overcome fear, to renew our holistic and divinely gifted identity, and to use this to build a community where we can accept the other and flourish in a mutual exchange of our gifts and talents. Quantitative facts have a place in this process, a prophetic place. They can state the reliable record of what is the case, force us to deal with external reality as it really is, help us process our identity away from the false myths that we like to believe about ourselves. An insistence on justified and reliably produced quantitative facts, such as those that many of us strive for in our university research, can resist the efforts of empire to arbitrarily invent facts which suits their purposes. However, if quantitative fact is made absolute, if we forget that truth is as much a narrative as it is a number, then our identity is reduced to numerical data. If number shifts from being a tool to an idol, it can prevent us from living the stories that build up this ver flourishing community. Thank you for listening.